I so appreciate you turning up on this strangest of strange days for us uh, here in Australia. We've got earthquakes going on. We've got all sorts of things. But uh, as I said a little bit earlier, there's nothing going to stop somebody like Olivia Ong. So let me just officially welcome you all. And thank you so much, Olivia, for being with us here today. I, of course, know an awful lot about you. And I, I thought if I start doing an introduction, I'm going to be going for 20 minutes. But let me just introduce you by way of being the author of yes. The Heart-Centeredness of Medicine. And uh, welcome, everybody. And Olivia, would you just start by telling us a little bit about yourself and why you wrote the book? Yeah, sure. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Olivia. I'm a pain physician here in Melbourne, but I'm also an author, speaker and coach. So I primarily help doctors who are burnt out, recover and manage their burnout so that they can thrive again. And even in, in this current climate where there's so much uncertainty right now, and I have to say the frontline healthcare workers are struggling and they're, prob they're, prob they're burnt out way before COVID and the pandemic has just made it 10 times worse. But that, that's the main reason why I decided to set, set up my business in the first place. Um, I'm a pain physician by trade, but I'm, I, as I said, I'm a coach. And one of the reasons why I wrote my book, The Heart Centeredness of Medicine, is because I've, I've just seen way too many doctors feel so lost and you know just you know, overwhelmed, burnt out, stressed. They've just lost their way. And I was once that doctor too. And I, I lost my way and, and I found myself, you know, back to my own heart. So I wrote the book purely because to help my fellow peers through burnout, give them some hope. Because burnout is such a um, soul wrenching um, condition that once you suffer burnout, it's essentially like, like the, a wounding to your soul that really it's hard to recover. And us doctors we have a universal language when we see each other when we've been through burnout just making eye contact silent communication speaks a lot so we it's it's basically like going to war together and having a, a common language in a way but i'll have to say that burnout is probably not unique to the healthcare industry it's probably probably across everyone around the world really every given the last 18 months we've been through hell and back literally with covid some of us have lost our jobs lost loved ones to COVID. And some of us couldn't even say goodbye to our loved ones because of COVID, like we're not allowed to visit them. But in, in the context of all that, my book will be quite relevant, not to just people in healthcare, probably people who are going through burnout. So in, in my book, I cover lots of heart-based tools like self-compassion, mindfulness, gratitude. But primarily I focused on a lot on self-compassion because this is what truly is lacking, I guess, or healthcare professionals find it really difficult to conceptualize and embody it. And what do I mean by that? Intellectually, it's not very difficult to comprehend self-compassion, three th pillars. First pillar is mindfully aware of your own suffering. Secondly, connection with yourself and others. And thirdly will be accept being kind to yourself, self-kindness. But the problem is this, you know, as healthcare professionals, we are so used to putting other people's needs above ours, especially patients, like patients for obvious reasons. Then after that, we have our family members and our loved ones above our needs, and we always come last. And the thing is with self-compassion, yes, easy to understand the three concepts, but if you ask a healthcare professional to actually I guess be, you know, to be aware of their own suffering, that's actually a hard thing in itself because a lot of them are going on autopilot. We can safely say for our New South Wales colleagues and so probably Victoria very shortly, that they're probably gonna go on, they've been on autopilot for many months now and just, you know, every day living a life like that, every day you wear, you know, the protective personal equipment, um, one wrong step and there's that chance you might get COVID and not only that you know they've been isolated from their loved ones so um, a lot of them 
are not able to probably live with their loved ones just because they work in a hospital with COVID cases and they choose to stay away from their loved ones and stay in accommodation near the hospital. And when you ask these um, healthcare professionals, I guess to be mindful of their suffering, it's really hard because they're actually having to put their own well-being first by even being aware of their own suffering because that's a starting point, right? And that's hard. Um, it is a paradigm shift and, and uh, embodiment practice shift, essentially. But once they've come to be aware of their own suffering, which is the awareness piece, then they start to connect to themselves and others, which is hard in itself. When you've been burnt out for so long, you, you're just feeling very isolated. And that is like a muscle, it takes a bit of practice. And then lastly, self-kindness, which is I think the hardest of all the three, because essentially they're opening literally opening their heart, letting love in. And then that's hard. And then they will come across a very uncomfortable feeling, what we call backdra backdraft. The firefighters probably will know what it is. Um, so firefighters, when they go in to put out fires, um, when they open a door that's been closed for a while, there'll be this surge of probably like oxygen and things, and it's really uncomfortable heat sensation. And that's essentially how they feel when they start to be kind to themselves. But over time, these three components, Jane and everyone else here, it's, it's like a muscle. You have to just practice it every day. It may be really uncomfortable to begin with, but yeah, like going to the gym initially when you work out, it's like, oh boy, my biceps hurt, <laughs> my triceps hurt. After a while, it's okay, you get stronger. It's the same with self-compassion. And I, I will encourage all of you to practice self-compassion too. Um, when you can, um, it, it, will, it will be very, very beneficial, especially when times are challenging. And as we stay in the current pandemic, yes, it will be still very challenging. And we still have to deal with post COVID issues, you know, like fatigue and stress related issues. Yeah, the, um, I guess that's essentially, I think my, I didn't expect the pandemic to continue when my book is out. Because uh, I was very optimistic. Oh, you had a launch, you know, you had yeah. a, an, an actual launch. You've done your virtual launch, which yes. is fabulous. But no, yeah. well, it it is, it, it is what it is. But um, you had a very brutal awakening. Mm. You, know, you didn't just stumble on self-compassion. No. So tell tell everyone a little bit more about that part of your story. Sure. Uh, so my journey to self-compassion has been a bit like um. You know, like when you, life really took a really unexpected turn when I was a junior doctor, I was basically living a life um, of any, like any doctor really, being an autopilot all the time. That's our lives really. And then I, one day I was walking to work and then I was hit by a car at high speed, high speed. So um, that was, it took me obviously by surprise to, it was actually witnessed by quite a number of my colleagues, which was quite traumatizing. They actually had, to go through counseling because they witnessed a car hitting me. But to me at that point in time, it happened really quickly. And before, I, uh, the next moment I knew uh, I was on the ground and my I was lying in a really awkward position. And obviously I went to doctor mode. I started going, you know, um, okay, obviously I could still understand, like I could still, still see the sky. I could understand what was going on. I didn't have a head injury because Someone with a head injury wouldn't know what was going on. Um, and I was starting to analyze what was happening. I was partly in shock, but start also partly in, in doctor mode. So I started um, thinking about, did I have a, uh, I guess, did, did I break my pelvic bones or did I have a spinal cord injury? So I was hoping for the, the pelvic fractures because bones heal. So I was like, you know, still optimistic despite lying in the awkward position on the ground. But when I went to the um, to the hospital, which is one of the major trauma centers in Melbourne, they did a CT scan straight away and told me the diagnosis that my back was smashed in half, literally. Yeah, no, sounds awful. Yeah, basically, yeah, and um, it actually um, the bone fragments went into the spinal canal where my spinal cord um, sat, and that's why I was paralyzed from the waist down and I couldn't feel. Um, I think when when the news landed on me. I, I think I was more in shock rather than being able to comprehend the gravity of the whole situation. And then I had emergency spinal surgery and then I spent a couple of weeks just trying to fight 
basically survive and fight back, essentially. But once I was medically okay, I was transferred to a rehab hospital and that's when reality sunk in because I saw many other people like myself, smart people um, having had devastated spinal cord injuries and we were all in the same ward. And, you know, like we, we all meet and we talk, we debrief and we talked about what happened to all of us. And that was when it really hit me. That was when grief actually finally hit me at full scale that I, there was a chance that I might not walk again. I might not, I probably won't have a normal life anymore. And I think the main thing I, I worried about was to, was whether I could work again as a doctor. That was my main focus because I spent like 10 years working up to that point, med school, um, doing my internship and my um, resident years. And I was just telling God, you know, like, um, why me? Like, I think I was really angry. Like I was only 28 when it happened. Like people at my at the age will be having the the prime time of their lives. And I had to actually just watch everyone around me just move uh, and like have enjoy life as it was normal. Well, here I am just like stuck in this bad, like nightmare movie that never went away. <laughs> it just perpetually every day was the same thing. Yeah, it, it was hard very hard for not only for myself for my husband too who I think when a devastating injury happens to some like yeah to someone it affects the people around them so I truly felt what it was like to be a patient yes and and that's quite an impart, uh, important part of your story isn't it yeah. and then there was a real turning point from just someone who said something in the context of you bravely going back to work. You had enough challenges in terms mm -hmm. of getting back to work and negotiating a workplace that's strange. Well, I'll say strangely enough, but nothing strange yet, actually in the scheme of things, but <laughs> strangely enough, not well set up for a person in a wheelchair. So that was one of the things you encountered, you, your, your identity in a sense, wasn't it? Your identity how do I fit in here? Mm. And um, but then that that real turning point, and uh, that led to you going to America. So there's so much in this story. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So one day I, um, I think this was Christmas 2009, when my intuition like told me to just pack my bags and go to America. It was just like that, you know, a very intuitive download. But I was like, America's really far away. It's like it takes about 24 hours to get there. And then my intuition told me, like it kept nudging and nudging. And she told me, just pack your bag, stay there for two and a half, two to three years, focus on your recovery and come back walking. And that's what I did. I told my, my employer that I was going to go to America and learn to walk again. My husband told his boss and then we all packed our bags and then we left for America. And it was, it was tell us a little bit about the then journey of, of getting the use of your legs back, because it was a lot of, you know, there was robotics, all sorts of mm. things that you found. Yeah. You know, like with um, rehabilitation with spinal cord injuries, sadly in Australia, when uh, we don't have adequate equipment, perhaps, but this particular facility in San Diego, United States, Project Walk, had all the equipment to help people with spinal cord injuries Walk, learn to walk again and that's boy then I, I felt like I was in a boot camp for like two or three years like I was just uh, it took me back to when I watched like the biggest loser I don't know that you all remember the biggest loser but essentially like that like they were all had to like be like survivor as survivor as well like lots of reality tv shows just remind me of that experience in the U.S. so I was working out Monday to Friday, nine to five. So basically five hours each day with some gaps in between to rest. Yeah, and um, that's how I learned to walk again because I told myself repetition is the mother of all learning. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to make sure my nervous system learns all it can to learn so that I can walk again. And that's what I did. So th those were the hard times where it's physically quite hard because I was, I had to learn to crawl, stand up, take baby steps literally because I had to learn to do all the steps a baby had to has to do mm. um, and then subsequently walking with some help and then walking with no help um, but in the midst of a busy physical therapy schedule I connect I made a lot of new friends people from all over the world because spinal cord injury doesn't 
it's it's not like global it's not like specific to a region it affects everybody around the world so we had lots of um, lovely gatherings together um, i was immersed in american culture watched lots of american football was invited to lots of thanksgiving dinners christmas dinners yeah um, the americans really made me feel really at home and that's why they are just immersed in the culture travel a lot as well in america um, I mean, I might as well just travel because I'm in San Diego. It's easy access to Los Angeles. And we have a local airport that took us to New York City, Canada. Yeah, travel a lot as well. So I, I didn't let a wheel, uh, being, in the, being stuck in a wheelchair stop me from traveling because I have I've always loved traveling. Mm. And my fellow spinal cord injury friends also travel. So they taught me the love of traveling. So uh, yeah, it, it was it was really um, fun, I guess, bittersweet and fun at the same time. Bittersweet, and the mm -hmm. amount I can only imagine the amount of tenacity to mm -hmm. be putting in eight hours a day, yes. physical training and and yeah. what have you. But um, the the excellent learning you learned, you know, the the joy of traveling, but mm -hmm. there was also the lesson of self compassion. Tell us about that and where it actually fits in. Where, how did that come about? Yeah. Um, so I was just reflecting. When I wrote the book, I reflected on my on my life before and after spinal cord injury, before and after self-compassion. Mm -hmm. So what actually helped me heal myself was self-compassion in my, in my experience in America. Because prior to my injury, I was... You know, I was a perfectionist, like many, many doctors are perfectionists. Like uh, when we make a little mistake, we will beat ourselves up, we will criticize ourselves, we will be really unkind. So when I, ref when I think of those days, I feel like, gosh, was I really mean to my younger self? <laughs> and, and I was, um, that was, that was me. And, and I guess I wasn't being mindful of, I, I was suffering through stress and burnout at that time. And I just really ignored my own well-being. Whereas my, my experience to learn to walk again taught me mind, to be mindfully aware of everything I do because learning to walk again, it's a very mindful experience. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that there's lots of mindfulness meditation teachers that teach a lot about mindful walking. But I think learning to walk again to, takes mindfulness to a whole different level um, because you have to be very consciously and being aware of doing every little thing and there's little steps to even crawl or sit up and things like that when one is injured and that's what I had to learn I had to learn and that's um, learning to be to be mindful was a beautiful experience I feel it made me slow down a lot more um, and the other thing um, when I was I guess pre-injury I was someone who relied on myself a lot I didn't ask for help and many doctors are like that we're often lone rangers just um, relying on ourselves to navigate the healthcare system. Um, and asking for help means that we are weak, we are not strong, we are incompetent. That's that you know, self-image issue, I guess, if we ask for help. But in my experience in the US, I, I learned to ask for help, especially in times where I've you know, been training for five hours each day and I'm just super tired and I just need some extra help. I just ask you know, my husband for some help, ask for friends, you know, if I feel a bit down over the, you know, and feeling a bit stressed over something, my, I will just call up some friends in the U, I mean, we're talking about this in the US, call up some friends in the U, in the um, spinal cord injury community and then they'll come over. I mean, they have wheelchair and all, we'll play poker, we'll play, we'll do everything just to cheer each other's spirits up, literally. And that's what connection did, it just helped me heal um, the healing piece was so strong. And lastly, I think after all that, I started to accept myself for who I was, mm -hmm. unapologetically, wheelchair and all, warts and all. And I guess prior to my injury, I was very conscious of my image, how I, how I, my bosses uh, you know, perceived me. I had to be this perfect intern, perfect resident, not making any mistake. Yeah, I had to live up to other people's expectations. In other words, I wasn't being kind to myself, but yeah, my experience at Project Watt just taught me that self-kindness piece the most as well. Yeah, so I only um, started reflecting on self-compassion when I wrote the book. Um, and that, that was what the um, my healing piece from the inside out was self-compassion. 
literally. And self-compassion saved me once again last year in, in stage four lockdown in Melbourne. Um, I just had my baby daughter then. And I think I, I was meant to get someone to help, like a mother's helper, and she couldn't come because they, um, yeah, we, we had stage four lockdown. So no one else, no one could come in. So I rely on self-compassion to help me through that um, awful period. And it, it did help me through that period. Um, it was hard, no doubt about it, it was hard. <laughs> but time, but the whole year, I think this year, I still tap into my self-compassion muscle because Melbourne has been hit really hard <laughs> with Absolutely. the pandemic. Yeah. No, no, it's a wonderful skill and it's a wonderful gift that, you know, there's the ripple effect of you having learned that. Yes. And uh, if I can share with everybody, yes. I was on the virtual book launch that yes. Olivia ran and a couple of doctors who, who appeared to be very senior people spoke about reading the book and what they had learned from the book. And there was just a palpable sense of that this is what we need as a profession. And uh, the, the lovely man who was moderating the whole session, he said, you've blown up the chat box here. There are so many questions. I can't answer all of the questions. I'm going to have to filter these people through to you. So, I mean, this book, uh, that there has never been a better affirmation of the importance and the relevance and the absolute rightness, for want of a, a better way to, to say this, the fact that, you know, you haven't been through what you've been through for nothing and um, and really, I, I just I take my hat off to you, though, for the fact that now <laughs> when I first met Olivia, um, we were having a conversation, as I often do with people who are, yeah. you know, connecting with me to, mm -hmm. to have a look at, well, what do I have to do to get started with my book and how will I publish it and all of these kind of things. And uh, it, it, it mm -hmm. eventuated that um, at that time, Olivia had a five-week-old baby, if yes. I'm right, and it was the first day she was going back to work herself. So the first yeah. time that that little baby was, you know, she had to get the, the baby settled to hand over to somebody else. And it was the day that she said yes mm. to writing the book. And I remember leaving that call and thinking, well, you know, this is someone I'm not going to be tough on. Oftentimes I have to pull out the, you know, the... Um, tougher Jane I'm, I'm naturally a people pleaser but I have to sometimes say to people well I'm sorry I have to call you on this you did yeah. say you'd have that chapter finished by now and this is now the third time that the chapter hasn't been finished so what's really going on and I thought well I'm going to be very you know hold back on the doing that for um Olivia, because uh, if anyone has a reason <laughs> for not getting, now talk about setting the bar pretty high too, because your goal was a chapter a week. Yes. And uh, I remember thinking, well, if anyone has an excuse for not, you know, doing the chapter a week, uh, then I think it's Olivia, not to mention the fact that there was a dark period in that 12 week period where you wound up back in hospital again and that not is, as a yeah. doctor. So, um, you know, really, I guess the point of me going through all of this is just mm. to say, yep, yeah, look, you, you made a decision to mm. get it done. You got it done. You didn't beat yourself up for the fact that it wasn't 12 weeks. So there is a learning, you know, something you have really seriously embedded. But mm. I'm wondering, do you have any tactics or things that you can share with people about, well, how did you actually get that book done in, I can't remember how many weeks it was, but it wasn't that many mm. more than 12. Yeah, probably, yes, 16, 16 18 weeks. weeks. I mean, hardly. Yeah, more. I think four <laughs> months. Yeah. <laughs> what, I took a month off to strategies? What can you uh, share here with people? Yeah. Um, uh, I guess a role, a personal development role model of mine, Simon Sinek, um, really talks about the why. And that's what I tapped into. Because there's, a, there's always a deeper meaning to why you want to write the book. And for me, Dr. Burnout was one, but sadly, I've just heard about other doctors. This is very emotional for me. Other doctors have committed suicide. Mm. Yes. Yes, look, there's a lot at stake. Yeah. So you yeah. were driven, in a sense, by, you, you know, your, it's, your, it's your mission. Exactly. It's your and purpose, I get it. Yeah. Yeah, and um, 
what really sparked me writing the book was last year, I guess in, in March, April, I was watching the news and then they talked about this ER um, physician in the US. Her name is Lorna Breen. I came to know about her name actually this year when I attended a conference that her brother-in-law uh, was part of where um, Dr. Lon, I'll tell you a bit about Lorna, Lorna's story. She was an ER physician who never had depression or mental health issues. But as we remember, the first wave of the pandemic really hit New York State very hard last year. Actually, many parts of the US were really badly affected. So her ER was, was just overwhelmed with COVID patients and she was just feeling slowly burning out and she developed depression. But she was so fearful to get any mental health support because she feared losing her medical license. And Australian doctors, unfortunately, still have that fear as well. So it's not just American doctors, Australian and many other doctors around the world have similar fears. And sadly, that was the reason that drove um, many other reasons I, I, I do know, but primarily her depression got so bad and then she, she committed suicide. She jumped off the building of the hospital that she worked in. And her younger sister, Abby, and brother-in-law, Corey, set, up, set a foundation in her name called Dr. Lorna Breen Heroes Foundation. So they, res, they raised a global awareness of physician suicide. They actually um, really talked about it very openly. They went on various media outlets, channels, spoke to many politicians to get, it, to get um, a legislation act passed so that doctors, when they have depression or anxiety or lots of the, like PTSD or various other mental health issues, when they seek help, they should not fear losing their medical license. They should not fear getting stigmatized or lose, or yeah, just that fear of losing their license or discriminated. And thankfully a month ago in, in um, the Capitol, I think, yeah, that's the, <laughs> um, the American politics recently, a legislation act has been passed in her honor to ensure that doctors in America will not be discriminated, will not lose their license when they seek mental health support for their mental health illnesses. So that was a big win for the physicians in the United States. And we can certainly advocate that in Australia. I certainly will advocate that here. And that was a big part of why I wrote the book because I thought to myself, if someone like Lorna, because there will be many Lornas in Australia too. Yeah. Um, who is feeling really helpless, hopeless, and on the brink of thinking of harming themselves. I just want them to just come across my book and giving them some hope and comfort that all is not lost. That's all I want. And that was the, my big why to keep writing the book despite all challenges, as Jane know, there's lots of challenges in writing the book. That was my why. So I think my advice for writers in, in this forum is to definitely stick to your why and there's always that one reader, one person who will read your book and, and his or her life will be transformed. So just always bear that in mind. When, when you feel like you got writer's block or something, that will supersede the writer's block and then you'll be back again. Momentum. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes, yes. I love that. Now, another thing that I know, I, I've generated quite a little bit of a buzz around mm -hmm. this because I'm so super proud of you about getting Jack Canfield so for anyone who doesn't know, Jack Canfield is the fellow behind Chicken Soup for the Soul, and he's written the foreword for Olivia's book. So it, now I guess this speaks to just the power of asking, but tell, tell a little bit more about how that felt and um, yeah. you know, with, with full disclosure too, there was a little a crack in the open door that you were able to walk yeah. through, but tell a little bit about that. Sure. Um, I've always been a big fan of Jack Canfield since I was 14. So I read all his Chicken Soup for the Soul books. And my mom actually reminded me again when she found out that Jack Canfield wrote the foreword for my book. I said, yeah, I remember those books. You had 20 of them. <laughs> yeah, sure. And um, yeah, Jack has always been my writer's, uh, my writer's role model, if you want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all of us have a writer role model that we want to kind of emulate. And Jack was certainly one of them. And over the last couple of years, I've been very involved with, I guess, his personal development work. I think he's big on um, law of attraction, mm -hmm. success principles. And I found myself in one of Jack's coaching programs and Jack became my coach this year. And he helped me through lots of challenges in life this year as well. And 
it was because of Jack's, um, I guess he is big on law attraction. I told my, and I asked myself, what if I asked Jack to write the foreword for my book? May I be brave to even do that? And that's why I did. Mm. And he said, yes. And he said it wasn't because I was in his coaching program. It was because he was very touched by my manuscript. And he was really like, yeah, he, he felt there was a need for my message to go out to the world about physician burnout. And that's why he agreed to write the foreword. But yes, he's, he, was my, he is my coach. I mean, not was, he's still my coach. But it was for that reason, because he has turned down many other people as well in the past. He, yeah, just, just because it, the story didn't resonate in his heart. But yeah, so I think it was, it was a bit about about that. Like I was just bold and brave and asked. Bold and brave and asked. And he, he he could sense your mission as well. Obviously that, I mean, the book is very clearly full of your heart, you know, the heart centeredness of medicine, your heart is in that book. Um, So that was a group coaching environment. Yes. A group coaching environment. Yes. Yes. And quite a big number of people. Exactly. So he didn't necessarily know you per se. Or, Not really, but, no. But, but it was handy, certainly, to have yeah. that open door. But to me, yes. the message here is that ask, ask the question. You never know what's going to happen there. Yeah, and I've got mm-hmm. met a few writer friends who actually ask personal development gurus. Like I have a friend of mine who just launched his book last week, a gastroenterologist, and he asked John DiMartini to write his foreword, and he agreed. Like John, like John DiMartini, I think he, very similar story like mine, like it was in John DiMartini's coaching program. Mm-hmm. John DiMartini is quite, you know, like he didn't have to say yes to it, but his story was, you know, would touch John mm-hmm. DiMartini's heart. And so I say my encouragement to all of you here who is going on, oh, I don't know whether I should ask Brene Brown to write forward. You never know until you ask. True. Or True. any other people that you really look up to, just ask them. Mm. Like, Hey, you, you know, pitch to them. You have to do. You have to craft a pitch, a good pitch as well, um, and ask them, "Would you write the forward for my book? Here's the manuscript. Have a read, and all that." You never, you never know who will say yes to them. Mm. Mm. That's right. That's right. And uh, earlier, you you mentioned that you know, of course, it's not only doctors or medical professionals who are needing the lesson of self compassion. Yeah. That brings me to the point about future, potentially future books. Yes. Talk a little bit about that and where, where you're looking at at the moment in terms of opportunities there. Yeah, I think the future opportunity will be of, uh, a second book, but I want to focus more on the spinal cord injury recovery aspect of it. Because I told myself when I was lying on the hospital bed, this is what I'm talking about 2008 when I was lying by in the hospital bed by myself, surrounded by other patients who are suffering as well. I told myself I have to write a book to give hope to people who are suffering through an illness or disability of some sort. So that's my second calling. Fantastic. But obviously this year is a calling for the frontline healthcare workers for burnout. Mm-hmm. But next year it's a calling for the spinal cord injury sufferers and many other sufferers out there who are going through hell and back. Let's put it that way. Yes. Spinal cord injury is just one of many, many conditions. Mm. Mm. Oh, fantastic. Mm. Now, I wonder if it, if it feels like time to open up for question and answer. <laughs> so, listen, who has a question for Olivia? Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Olivia. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I hope you can hear me. I'm sitting outside yes. today. It looks nice. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is. And look, I can so resonate with your why, you know, the, mm. the reason for writing your book. The first thing that comes to my mind is uh, personal experience. I have two elderly parents. My father got brain cancer a few months ago. And so I, for the first time, had my introduction to the hospital system, the medical uh, system. And um, I could see from both sides of the fence uh, the impact that it has for both the patients and all of the amazing staff who, you know, the doctors and nurses and everybody yeah. who put their lives on the line 24 7 in terms of energy and what they're giving. Mm. And, and I really feel for them, even the local GP, uh, I had mm. to move out of Sydney to a regional area to uh, be around for my parents. And yeah. I'm very aware that the local doctors are run off their feet and uh, you can sense um, their stress levels. 
And so I love that you have shared your story. I love, I haven't heard of this before, this particular topic, and, and I'm not taking away from your your accident that you had, but mm. I'm so glad that you are reaching out to share the inside story of what it is to be a doctor and a physician under all of that stress. Yes. So I'm asking, um, how will you specifically target that audience? How will the GPs um, feel safe and not exposed by mm. wanting to go read your book? Because I, I, I hear what you're saying is that there's yeah. a little bit of fear around going, hey, I feel stressed, you know, wanting, not wanting to admit that, mm -hmm. but you, you are taking the myth away and you're making it easier for people to have, have that conversation. Will you be having ways to be able to bring that to them and say, hey, I have something to share with you and um, to make it easier for them to um, approach the subject of their own health and well-being? Yeah. Mm, that's a very good question, Rebecca, because right now for my PR book campaign, I'm actually reaching out to the various colleges. We're talking about the College of GPs, College of Surgeons, College of Physicians. There's, there's many of them, yeah. but yeah. primarily I, I, I'm actually also reaching out to the Australian Medical Association mm. um, about this, because I think um, we need to do what the um, what Lorna's brother-in-law and sister have, have done, they've done. Mm. Someone has to lead some kind of movement, awareness. And I think the, the awareness piece will be, like at the moment for me right now, I'm working from the bottom up. So I'm coaching doctors who are burnt out, who come to me confidentially, like, hey, I've got burnout. I need some help. So I coach them through, you know, obviously if they have severe burnout, they've got depression, anxiety, they do have to see their psychologist and see their GP. But um, I'm doing what I can from the bottom up. I think a lot of things needs to be done from the top down. We're talking about government. Yes. I'm looking at you, um, Premier of Victoria. <laughs> which oh. <I'm> sure, <laughs> well, I'm sure Dan will understand. So I just call it like, as if he's my friend. So because Dan Andrews um, has also gone through a similar experience. He's, he had a fall and he broke his back. So, you know, like he will know what it's like to be, obviously he probably has the, ex, the red carpet treatment and all that stuff being, being the Premier of Victoria, but I think it's like the politicians need to be aware of it. What I'm sensing at the moment right now is politicians are talking about revitalizing the economy, opening up borders, yes, and vaccination and all that stuff. But the well-being of the frontline healthcare workers, which include GPs as well, they kind of forgot to talk about them or kind of like really don't talk about it very much. And Rebecca, you raised a very good question. I think it's getting people like in the politician setting, CEOs in hospitals, leaders in hospital organizations, healthcare organizations. Mm. So the more people in the top up know about it, yes. the more they're aware of it, yes. the more yes. they will. So I think they, we all have to meet in the middle. So the bottom um, up people like, you know, the other, the doctors who are burnt out and those who doctors who have burnt out like myself and recovered, mm. we all will have a unanimous voice together and we'll meet them in the middle, which is politicians, Premier of Victoria, hopefully, <laughs> and uh, leaders of organizations and hospital bodies just meet in the middle and we talk about, have an open conversation about it. Yeah, I love, I love that you are talking mm -hmm. from a multi-prong approach. Mm -hmm. um, having worked in um, corporate organizations, as well as coming from a, um, a health and well-being perspective, I'm a coach as well, I'm in, yes. and I'm in the health and spiritual space so mm. I'm very aware of that conversation um, yes. but in the corporate setting I know very well that coming from the top down is so essential so yes. approaching the CEOs of the hospitals and even um, because my parents are elderly even mm. aged care facilities you know those frontline workers yes. but but targeting the message at you know at the leaders of those organizations um, to normalize it and to put exactly. it on the table, because if you don't have a buy-in at the top level, then it doesn't filter down. No, and it doesn't. It's I so agree. much harder to get to the bottom level. And you kind of spend a lot of energy and effort, don't you? And it's needed down at the bottom, mm -hmm. but you feel like you're spinning your wheels and it's harder to get that bigger overall effect Um I have um, a relative in the family who's a doctor, a GP, um, mm. so I know what it's like for her as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's almost a hush-hush because you're working in a, in a highly responsible uh, situation yeah. 
And you're right, it, that perception that you've got to have your shit together. <laughs> Essentially, yeah. And yeah. the stigma, the fear and stigma around it. Yeah. That's and that's and that's really tough. Um Anyway, look, I love what you're doing and I think it's amazing and well done for sharing your personal story. Thank and I really everybody. wish you all of the best and that you're Thank able to get in where you need to get in and be heard. You know, health ministers, the whole thing. That's right. Um, yeah, good luck with that. All right. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. Well, that was actually fabulous, um, you know, response, Rebecca. And my, my head now is going like crazy because Olivia... I want you to send a copy that this is the power of an actual physical book. And you've got those. They look fabulous. They've come yeah, up. Yeah, I don't thank you've you. Got the, real, the real book now. Pop one in an envelope for Daniel Andrews. Mr. Andrews? Yeah, I think yeah. he deserves to read them. Absolutely. No, no, but, but not, not joking. Not at all joking. No, I know. I'm serious. But, yeah, um, you know, and perhaps a, a handwritten card about, you know, I'm, I'm aware that you also have uh, experienced the spinal cord. Uh, I'm hoping this book might open a conversation mm. about how we, i.e. you and me, Mr. Andrews, how we can work together to bring some, you know, some respite and healing to the medical practitioners. I mean, I'm actually really fired up now, Rebecca. Yeah, me thank too, you for that. Jane, I'm fired you, up too. You know, <laughs> let's do this. <laughs> let's do this He's thing. probably reeling from it. <laughs> and let's have another one. I know, look here, here, you've got all this spare time, honey. You've got those two kids now. You've got the job. You've got the coaching practice. You've got all the pay. How are you doing? But, yep, and we, we also want one for the head of the AMA. Yes, he, he gets a copy. Yep, yeah, beautiful. So this is, um, um, I'm so excited about this. Yeah, really. you, you, I'm sorry, have put yourself now front and centre. And that's the thing with this now. You've, you've sort of, it's found you. This mission has found you as much as you found it through writing the book. Just watching this evolve, I'm just on, mm. on a buzz <laughs> with <laughs> excitement about you can, you, you can do this, really. And the fact now also that you learned the lesson, uh, you know, I hate to say this, but it's the gift out of that horrendous experience of being hit with the car and all those years since. You've been given the gift, though, of understanding and seeking help. The, the amount of people you are connected with Mm. Uh, to get this message out there. there there's honestly, the, the train has left the station. There is no stopping it now. And, um, you know, wow, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's like the Shinkansen in Japan. Mm. More, that's like the bullet train. It's more yeah. like that now. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Yes. So anyway. And, Jane, and also um, Olivia just coming back to really reinforcing for yourself. Yes. Um, that that you're on a mission you have been given your mission for this lifetime and that is to be the mouthpiece for the physicians doesn't matter what level of physician mm -hmm. um, for the physicians to to be recognized and to normalize that what they're going through is real and that their self-care because what my mission is is about self-care and well-being as yes. well so I, I, I resonate with mm -hmm. your message um, and and to give them permission Yes, so I love it. Your permission. Story, give them permission to self care and to have self compassion, but to normalize it in the hospital setting because it's a machine mm -hmm. and they're expected or treated to be a part of that machine like a robot that there's there's no time or place for them to have feelings or to have a meltdown or which is obviously essentially. Wrong. Yeah, and to really take it to the people that need to hear it, those leaders, and get yourself on podcasts and start speaking about it as much well, as I've, you can. I'm already on podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Olivia's all over the place, but oh, it is that, I think, just getting in at that level that the people, mm. Sophie Scott's the medical reporter for the ABC and your, your Norman Swans and people like that, you know, people who mm. have the voice, but you, you, you've got the voice. But I can hardly wait what can a worms is going to um, wait to see what can of worms is going to open up when I say who's got another question <laughs> that's okay I, I love questions they actually uh, I, I love them because they yeah. it means, it's very we can go very deep conversations I love it um uh, Olivia thank you um sorry mm. I came in late that's um, okay. one of the the questions that then came up for me was um is un, uh, particularly when we're talking about people um, 
accusing to suicide mm. um, is is a, a an understanding of the structure of conflict useful for you so that in terms of integrated problem solving the lose-lose option of suicide mm. is is understood that that's what it is mm. and that there's uh, a matter of flipping your frame of reference or reframing the situation um, in order to not go down that path where where it, it looks like a lose lose option and it doesn't matter what you do you're going to lose. Mm. So, um, it, would that be useful help for you? Well, I think if they're at a stage where they are thinking of suicide, it, it means a few things. It's probably depression really setting in to that point of, but I think where the, where the reframing can work is before they reach that, that stage, it's where it's like mild to moderate burnout, if I wanna categorize it like a, like a condition, medical condition, mild to moderate burnout is when they will still be receptive to reframing um, and all that. And I'm sure Rebecca can relate because she's a coach. It's, but at the stage where they are, you know, thinking of suicide, that's when they need mental health support. That's when they need a psychologist, a GP, a psychiatrist, even. Yeah, yeah it might not yeah. be helpful, I guess, but it, uh, certainly I think a psychologist doing that kind of framework, I think they do that as well, will be helpful, but they need a lot more support, like more multidisciplinary support. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess I was thinking more, more uh, broadly in terms of unhealthy thinking. Mm. And, and so that understanding the whole frame of reference in terms yeah. of unhealthy thinking mm. that then leads to the inability to solve problems or yeah. of perpetuating and creating more problems because you're making fundamental choices. But there we go. I... Mm, because I think a, a doctor, some, you know, they force themselves through that kind of, they're already very unwell mentally, but they're still in a fit, like Rebecca described it, like in a robotic structure. They still have to function like machines, but they have a very unhealthy mind, like their mind is not sound anymore. And that's really a, a, a recipe for disaster. So I think that's why the top-down approach is really important. That's why the hospital leaders need to acknowledge that the well-being of doctors is very important and they should make it, you know, like somehow structurally and implement it in a, um, in a doable way rather than just ticking off a checklist, which is some hospitals, they just like to tick off some checklist saying, yeah, I've, I've got a wellbeing program and then it's, that's done, but mm -hmm. the doctors don't implement any strategy. They don't even attend them because there's another thing on their checklist. So they don't turn up and right. yeah, they need to actually be, I think the leaders in the hospital need to actually go down the trenches literally and find out what it's like to be a doctor, shadow them, or something for a week and find out what truly it is like to be a doctor or a nurse, even a nurse. Similar life, similar life as well, like in a grueling environment where they're forced to even ignore everything, ignore their own well-being, their own personal needs, and just to do their work and function. Especially now with COVID, it's even worse. You know, mm -hmm. they have to wear the the PPE and everything. It's even ten times worse. Yeah. So what we're what we're talking about here actually also is about a wholesale culture change, exactly. isn't it? This is a, a book that isn't solving that problem per se, uh -huh. but is opening that conversation yes. in a very real way, so that you know self self compassion, those skills are absolutely fundamental to mm -hmm. anybody's well being, mm -hmm. certainly people under as much pressure as, as people in the medical um, industry are, but it's that bigger question of, you know, what, what culture is going to support those kind of well being strategies? What culture is going to enable people to, and, and as you've said, you know, destigmatize the matter of talking about mental health or even being tired even being burnt out, very mm. two very different things, by the way, but just to be able to say words about, I am human, mm. I have needs too. Mm. Exactly. Um, that's why it's so important to find other like-minded individuals as well to work, collaborate together. Um, mm. And suddenly I found that um, there is a community of doctors out there around the world who are very like-minded and they are also chipping away 
top down, bottom up, whichever way, yeah. in, in their own in their own um, coaching programs or consultancy service, or even their physician as a physician, not even coach aside, um, just doing their 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 own uh, bits and action just to raise awareness of everything, of the whole issue. I think um, what was the, um, I think the highlight was when Ariana Huffington, I recently attended a physician burnout summit and Ariana Huffington was one of our guests for that summit. And she talked about her burnout story and she's not a doctor, but she suffered through such severe burnout that she collapsed and I think fractured her cheekbones or something. And she wrote, I think she wrote a few books about burnout. So um, actually I'll have to, Go and buy Ariana's books. I don't actually have any of them and I do want to buy them. Um, and Ariana is a big, yeah, she was just openly talking about it. Like we just had a fight, like she just had a fire set side chat with the host. It was like she not she also normalized the conversation. And you're right, Jane, it's all about opening up conversations. And and that's another person to send a copy of your book to, I reckon. I, I did, I did. Oh, I did okay, good. <laughs> She's, my, she's one of my uh, role models. I definitely oh, had to copy down her way as well. Yes, <laughs> yes. And Oprah, you know, yes, really it's people. that thing of it's no, 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 no height is too high to reach for. Um, but we've, I think, got probably time for one more question mm -hmm. if anyone has one. Oh, yes, lovely. Oh, Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my background is I've been an airline pilot for many years, and I recognize, of course, some of these questions are starting to be voiced when we have our um, um, personal development days every year. Um, of course, yeah, uh, burnout or, or even just mental ill health yeah. is um, would be a big issue. And uh, the courage to voice that uh, because people don't know what that would really mean if they came to their supervisors and said um, yes. I'm, I'm not feeling all right what, what yeah. would the implications be so they're starting to talk about that a little bit more to mm -hmm. make people um, dare to to talk about it and dare to actually mention it and um, Still, I feel they haven't made it clear. Um, you know, uh, uh, will you lose your license? They say, come and let us know. Of course, it needs to be brought into the open. But what does it mean? Is it sort of, I think people still might think, oh, is, that, is that a trap if I do come in? Will they then say, oh, well, sorry, obviously you can't work anymore if, if you feel like that. So um, it's, it's something. And, and uh, not only mental ill health, but like you said, burnout, catching it before it comes to burnout. And when we talk about, we've got very, very, very rigorous, rigorous regulations about our uh, uh, work times, how many hours we can work, yeah. how many days in a row, and, and we're always compared then to doctors, because you, of course, you can have, I don't know, shifts of 48 hours or something crazy like that. And uh, we sort of pat ourselves on the back a little bit in the aviation community saying, we've got these rules in place to, to uh, prevent that. Um, and the doctors could sort of uh, listen to us and take uh, take a note out of our book in, in that but yeah it's interesting to hear this uh, this conversation from your uh, background from your standpoint mm. and Michelle, Michelle you raise a very good point because every time they, when they talk about physician wellness and well-being they always refer reference the pilots yeah yeah and it's quite interesting that you guys have got strategies in place rightfully so because you have got like many lives on on the plane I guess if you're mm. Yeah. At the stake, isn't it, literally? Yes, yeah. The difference I always say, though, we've got many more lives at stake, uh, but we are one of it. Uh, mm -hmm. As apart from a surgeon, I'm sure they all do their very best every time, but their life is not at stake. And so I always used to say, if the only person I need to think about is me. <laughs> Might yeah. self sounds uh, sound selfish, but if I make it home, I want to come home to my family too. If I make it home, all of those people make it home as well. Exactly. I think this is where the conversation of doctors is now starting to be aware, like, hey, I got to look after my own well-being first. 
Mm-hmm. Or else I won't be good to myself, to my patients, to anybody, my loved yeah. ones especially. Yeah. So I think, yeah, you know, like these conversations are all popping up, especially when they have Are You Okay Day, which actually not like really open a lot of conversations. And then uh, one of my uh, friends, um, Dr. Jeffrey Goodwood, and he he um, created Crazy Socks Day. I don't know whether you guys have heard of. Yeah. So he um, he suffered through depression and came out on the and burnout, and he came out on the other side. So he um, is a big advocate of physician wellness and physician burnout. Yeah. And I think it's just people like me and Jeff just trying to like like using a a megaphone and going, hey, listen, you no, know, we got a message, people like. Yeah. Yeah. Like and then just creating awareness. I think awareness is like creating awareness is so underestimated. Like just the impact of one voice and then it amplifies other voices, opens up many doors, opens up many courage, yeah. many many others to courageously express themselves. Yeah, and um, I'll continue to keep doing it even yeah, well even done. in twenty twenty two and the years to come. I'll still keep doing it because yeah. <laughs> I see how important it is having been through it myself, yeah. Yeah. And more power to you, Olivia, (laughs) yes. Yes. Well, look, I wanna thank you for writing this wonderful book and for doing the work that, you know, you're you're putting yourself out of a comfortable position where you can be just going off and working in a, you know, high pressured environment, but you're putting yourself in front of the camera all over the place. Someone mentioned podcasts. Well, you you are turning up everywhere and it's that turning up Mm. that, I know is is a big journey for you but you're taking it all on and Mm -hmm. uh, you know I really want to acknowledge you for that and I want to thank everybody for coming along today Mm -hmm. and for the fabulous questions Mm -hmm. this has just been a a wonderful session and um, you know I'm just as I say let's watch this space and see where this book really really can take your mission Olivia. Mm -hmm. Thank you Jane thanks everyone for coming. Yes thank Thank you. you everyone.